Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. There's some really good energy at church this morning. So glad to see all of you are here. And uh, so thankful that God has brought you to worship with us here this morning. My light is green, so we're, we're good to go. This morning's uh, first service, I uh, about 25 minutes into the message, I didn't have my green light on. So we're green this morning, but we're good to go. But again, it's so good to see each and every one of you. Trust that you had a wonderful week and uh, that the blessing that you received this week will allow you to get through until we meet back again. I uh, wanted to just make just a couple of comments. Thank you, church, for praying for my, my wife. She is here this morning with a brand new member of our family. And so uh, it's, thank you for your prayers and for your love and showering us with, with, with gifts and with food. And uh, I've been eating really good this past week. So uh, again, thank you, church. And there is a shepherd's pie waiting for us when we get home this afternoon. So we're all set to go. But uh, again, thank you, church, for uh, your love and for supporting us. So what we're going to do at this time, let's go ahead and stand. We're going to have an opening word of prayer, and then we're going to get right into our singing this morning. Let's pray. Father, you're so good to us, and thank you for the reminder of the cross that we looked at this morning in Psalms. And I pray that as we look at Galatians today, that we'll be reminded of that wonderful news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your, your son. Thank you for sending him to die on the cross for my sins and for the sins of the whole world. Lord, you're so good to us. You're so gracious. Father, we commit this service to you now. Lord, I pray that as we sing this morning, that it will be honoring and glorifying to you, that we'll lift up our voices all in one accord as we praise your wonderful name. Bless this service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good morning. There's a lot of you guys today. It's good to see. So um, if you join us, first song, I grabbed the wrong paper is uh, I lift my eyes up. that is of uh, of uh, how uh, how we can look to him and and uh, help us through life and uh, that leads into our next song of uh, he is exalted and step by step and we think through the lyrics of uh, step by step of uh, how great it is that that uh, he's there uh, 
uh, leading us and uh, encouraging us along the way and, and uh, he's got a bigger plan for us so uh, he is exalted. see the church filled like this. It's been a while since we've seen it like this. Everyone, we have a new baby here for the first time, Emmeline Bennett. She looks pretty cute. Oh, we have an, oh! Pastor's new kid, is it kid, Cody? Cody is here as well. I didn't know there was, I only got one over here, all right. Um, And the boys' basketball team last night, or wasn't last night, it was yesterday, had a great game. I know they lost. I know Sam here. Where at? Oops, Sam, that was a great game. We were listening to the game, me and my wife, about three minutes to go in the end of the game. We lost the radio. We are calling people. Finally, Danielle answered, and she became an announcer for the rest of the game. It was a great game. I know, I know you guys lost, but that was a great game. Uh, announcements. Next week is going to be the Christian Ed a meeting. It's not going to be tonight. And you're still going to have a choir tonight at 6.30. Um, our Good Fridays is, is going to begin at 7 p.m. Sunrise service is going to begin at 7 a.m. on Easter morning. Uh, remember that sportsman banquet. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. It's the 27th. It's, uh, 27, it's a good... It's a good um, I know I have some people I'm going to invite. It's going to be a, it should be a fun time. It's going to be a fun time. 
Um, there's going to be a ladies retreat at Twin Lakes April 23rd through the 24th. And then um, I know Valerie Good had a good surgery. And we just need to continue to pray for her recovery, a successful one. And there's, there's a lot of people on this prayer request, guys. We need to try to keep in mind to pray for them every day, okay? All right. Yes. You guys come home. Come down. Oh, yes, sir. I got two thank yous that I want to give out to everybody. Uh, the first one uh, was a surprise. It's very organized for my birthday. I've been doing the Santa suit thing for years with 25 year old Santa suit. So I know that there's several of you people in the congregation that donated to buy me. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just come to you this morning. We thank you. Um, what a wonderful day that we can come together and praise your name and worship you. And we just pray and we just thank you so much for this day. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Like a
I like that song, so I was just sitting here listening to it. Um, so if you guys want to join us again. Um, so the next song uh, is In the Garden. It's a old hymn, and, and I, uh, I did a little bit of research on it because I enjoy the history of things. Um, and it was written by Austin Miles. And uh, so uh, after he, he'd written it, uh, he kind of had an interview on, on um, you know, why he wrote it and everything. And he said he was reflecting on uh, John 20. Um, and it was kind of the story of the first Easter. And uh, I'll just read this quote here that he said. Um, he says, I read, as I read it that day, it seemed to be part, I seemed to be part of the scene. My hand for resting on the Bible while I stared at the light blue wall. As the light faded, I seemed to be standing in the entrance of a garden, looking down gently winding path, shaded by olive branches. A woman in white, with head bowed, hand clasped her throat as if to choke back her sobs, walking slowly into the shadows. It was Mary. As she came to the tomb upon which she placed her hand, it bent over to look and in a hurry away. John, in flowing robe appeared, looking at the tomb. Then came Peter, who entered the tomb, followed slowly by John. As they departed, Mary reappeared, leaning her hand upon her arm at the tomb. She wept. Turning herself, she saw Jesus standing, and so did I. I knew it was he. She knelt before him with his arms outstretched, looking into his face, and cried, Rabbi, I awakened in full light, gripping my Bible with my muscles tense and nerves vibrating. Under the inspiration of this vision, I wrote as quickly as the words would be formed a poem exactly as it has since appeared. That same evening, I wrote the music. So I guess as, as we, uh, you know, read through the Bible and everything, uh, uh, kind of envisioning, uh, you know, what, what's being said and... Uh, so this was a, an interpretation from him on, uh, on that first Easter. So, in the garden. If you guys could please stand. This morning is uh, I Will Rise.
Dismissed? Nope. Nope. Not yet. <laughs> Sorry. Jump. You kids can come on up front. We're kicking Pastor Jerry out of the spot. Come on up to the two rows in the front here if you want. Hi guys. How are you this morning? Good. You're good too? I'm glad. All right. We don't have very many people on this side. Can you guys, even though you don't have as many, can you guys be loud on this side, do you think? Yeah. Pretty sure you can, Trin. Okay. All right. So this morning, first I want to see if your guys' brains are awake and you remember anything from last week, okay? Let me ask the question first. All right, so we are doing I am's. Remember, in the book of John, Jesus talks a little bit more about himself and says, these are the things I am, okay? So last week, we learned that Jesus said, I am what? What, Emma? Say it in the microphone. The bread. The bread of life. The bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Well, today, we're going to learn another I am. But first, I'm going to tell you a story that I bet a lot of you have heard before. Now, I was thinking about kids' stories. How many of you like it when your moms or dads read you a story? Do you like it? Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Well, have you ever thought about how many kids' stories have a big, bad wolf in them? A lot of stories. Well, this morning we're going to tell a big bad wolf story. And this is where I'm going to need your help, okay? I'm going to tell the story about the three little pigs. So this is what I need. When I point to you guys, you guys are going to be my pigs. Can you guys be pigs? Oh, good job. Good snorts. Okay. So when I point to you guys, you guys are going to say, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Ready? Let's practice. Not, Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. And that makes you guys the big bad wolves. Can you do it? Okay. The big, can we switch? The big bad wolves. So you guys, when I point to you guys, you're going to say, little pigs, little pigs, let me in. Ready? Little pigs, little pigs, let me in. And then when I point back to you, you'll say, then I'll huff. And I'll puff, and I'll blow your house down. Okay, you guys are ready. So, here's our story. So one day, a mommy pig had three pigs, and she said, it's time for you guys to go out on your own. Well, they left their house, and they went and built their own. Well, first pig decided he would build a house of straw. So he built a nice looking house. He's in there all comfy and cozy, and all of a sudden he hears, knock 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 and there's a wolf at the door and he says little pig little pig let me in and the pig says not, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin well the wolf said then i'll huff and i'll puff and i'll blow your house down well sure enough the wolf blew and guess what happened splat down came the house well, that little pig took off running. He ran to his brother's house, knocked on the door, let me in, let me in. He got in there. Now, this was a nice looking house made of sticks. So the two pigs are in there, comfy and cozy. Uh-oh, and they hear it. And they hear the wolf say. What does the wolf say? He says, little pig, little pig, let me in. And he says, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Well, sure enough, he blew and what happened? The house came down. Well, those two pigs took off running as fast as they could to the third brother's house. The third brother's house made his house of bricks. They get in that house they're still scared because they know that wolf's going to come. Next thing they hear, the wolf's at the door. And the wolf says, little pigs, little pigs, let me in. And the pigs say, 
not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. Then I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Well, he blew and he blew, but what happened? It didn't blow down. It stayed strong because it was of brick. And when those pigs saw that there was no way that wolf was going to get in, finally they weren't scared. And when they weren't scared, all three sang, Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? The big bad wolf? The big bad wolf? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? Tra la 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 la. Have you guys heard that story before? Did you know, this is something you might not know. Did you know that Jesus told a story about a big bad wolf? Did you know that? Huh, he did. He knew, okay, good job. It's in the book of John, and this is what it says, okay? Now, we first you gotta know a little bit about the story, and that is when Jesus says, the good shepherd, he's talking about himself, okay? And when he says a hired hand, do you know what that is? That's somebody that's just paid to take care of the sheep. Okay, he doesn't really care about him, but he's paid to do it. The next person is the sheep. And guess who the sheep are? All of us. We're all the sheep in the story. And then there's the big bad wolf. And guess who the big bad wolf is? Satan. Now you ready? Here's our next I am. So in the book of John chapter 10, this is the story Jesus tells. You ready? Listen carefully. He says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus said, the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. A hired hand will run away when he sees a wolf coming because the sheep don't belong to him and he doesn't really care about them. When the hired hand runs away, the wolf will attack and scatter the sheep. But this is the part Jesus says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I will lay down my life for the sheep. And in a little while, a couple weeks, we're gonna celebrate Easter, right? And that's where we remember who laid down his life for us? Jesus, the good shepherd. And we're all sheep, right? And it says, Satan, the big bad wolf, is out to get us, but there's only one way we don't have to be afraid of him. You know how? If we're trusting in the good shepherd, which is? Uh-huh, Jesus. If we're trusting in Jesus, guess what we can say? Who's afraid of the big bad wolf? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and close in prayer, and then if you are second grade and under, you can come downstairs, all right? So Jesus, I thank you so much for each one of these kids. And we thank you for this reminder that you said you are the good shepherd. And even though Satan has bad plans for us, when we trust in you, we don't have to be afraid because you are in control. And we thank you for that. We love you, Jesus, that you laid down your life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good job, guys. You're good storytellers. So go ahead and sit with your parents unless you're second grade and under and head on downstairs. And then those three little pigs who are so comfy and cozy in their brick house made its way to the Fred Farms where we slaughtered them. We're going to have a hog roast on the 27th, amen? So that's a great commercial for our hog roast. Be there March 27th, 6 p.m. It's going to be a great, great time. You know, today feels like Christmas to me. We've been advertising this series in Galatians for weeks now and um, really looking forward and getting into this, this uh, study with you all. I, I really hope to continue to do this throughout, uh, th throughout our, here at uh, Fulton Baptist Temple and any chance I get to, to speak and preach. My goal in life is to preach through every verse of the Bible. So our first series, our first sermon, or first service, sorry, we've been going through Psalms, so I'm going to tackle that. I'm going to preach through verse by verse here in Galatians, and then uh, move forward from there and, and um, pray that it's a blessing to you. I know I've been getting a lot out of this study out of Galatians, and so th this morning is going to be an overall book sermon. We're not going to dive into the first chapter and the first verse just yet. We're going to get an entire picture 
of what this book was written about. Um, I would like for us, before we begin this series in Galatians, so if you will turn there to Galatians chapter 1, I would like to ask you two very important questions. In regards to Galatians, why, why should we study Galatians? And secondly, why did God have this epistle be sent to the churches of Galatia? Let's tackle that, that second question first. Here, why did God have this epistle to the letter, the letter of Paul to the Galatians? Why was this epistle written? Why is this letter written to this group of churches? Galatia is a region. It's not necessarily one church. Uh, the other letters that we see in, in Scripture, the church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, or when, when God used Paul to write to Timothy or to Titus. When we see different letters in the Bible, they were written for a specific person or a specific church in mind. Here is a region. There was four different cities within Galatia. And I have a map. Aaron, if you'll jump over to the, the, the second slide. Uh, there's... This region is, has four different uh, churches within it. You, number one, there was the church of Lystra. We see in Acts chapter 14 on one of uh, Paul's missionary journeys. And this is modern day Turkey, in case you're wondering, just uh, north of the Mediterranean Sea. But Lystra was mentioned in Acts chapter 14. And then also the same verse is a city by the name of Derby. And uh, these, these particular cities... Were, uh, were under Roman control at the time, like m much of the Middle East, you know, Jerusalem and whatnot. So this was all under the, the, the adventures of Rome, and they're trying to conquer the whole world. And so they were under some, some uh, with the Roman Empire, the Roman government. And here we have these other two cities, Antioch and Iconium. Again, they're all listed for us, even in the book of Acts. I think of Acts chapter 14 and verse number 19, when the Apostle Paul ran into some Jews from these particular cities. It says, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Well, wasn't that a welcome sight for Paul? The, the writer of Galatians. And so Paul has a personal investment to these people. See, what Paul would do when he would go to a, a new place on his missionary journeys, and we know that, that Paul, after he found Jesus Christ, after Christ revealed himself, he was on fire to tell the whole world about Jesus Christ. Wherever he went, he said, I need to tell people about Jesus. So here Paul made us all the way up to what we now know as modern day Turkey, to this region of Galatia. And what he did, his, his MO was he would first go to the synagogue. Because remember, uh, God wrote, said, this is to the Jews first and then to the Greeks, then to the, the Gentiles, then, then uh, to the people of the world. So Paul would visit the synagogue. There he would tick off the Jewish religious leaders and they said, no, we're, we're not believing in the Messiah. We don't believe that Jesus has come. We don't believe that the Messiah that Psalm 22 writes about or that the uh, Isaiah or some of the minor prophets, that's not the Messiah. Jesus, the one who was crucified and in Jerusalem, no, that is not the Messiah. He is not yet to come because, again, they were looking for a political savior. They were looking for someone to get out from underneath the bondage and the foot of the Roman Empire. And so they said, Paul, that's, that's not it. And so they would stone him. They would throw him out of their cities. But Paul was determined to see the Galatian church prosper. He wanted them to thrive. And he had heavy investment into, this, into these churches. That's why this, this uh, epistle is written so differently than when you look over in Ephesians. And how the greeting is much different than what we see here in Galatians. 
He says in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, that's Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Because Paul has so much time and energy into them. He said, church, I love you. I want to see you thrive. I want to see what's best for you. I even put my own life on the line for you. That's how invested I am into this church, into this region. So here... This epistle was, lit, was written because there were Judaizers, there were, there were folks, there were people that tried to distort the gospel, as we just saw in verse number 6. That these Christians that were here in Galatia, that, that Paul invested so much time into them, and they were turning to a different gospel. They were turning to a gospel where works had to be added to it or where things had to be done. And it wasn't just enough to know of the freedom of Christ and that he could take away all the sins of the world. No, things had to be done on top of it. And so Paul was writing this letter to correct those very actions. This, Paul, this, this letter, again, to the Galatian churches of all four of these different cities was written so that they, the uh, that the things that were creeping in the false teachers could be corrected some jews uh, eventually would believe and that they would turn and again this this region these churches were prospering but many times persecution came in and and execution came to to some of these early christians and that's one thing but Paul finds out that there are false teachers creeping in to these churches who claim to be Christians who have, who have come inside the church and they're perverting the wonderful news of the gospel. And Paul is furious. That's enough, he says. Even over, over in chapter 3, verse 1, Oh, foolish Galatians! He calls them fools. Why again? Because he has so much time. He has so much energy. He loves these churches. And so God uses Paul to write these letters uh, to these, to write this letter to this, this region so that they can turn from the false teachers, so they, they can learn uh, of what is right and what is wrong and to hold fast that wonderful truth of the gospel. He's refuting this false teaching. That false teaching was adding works to salvation. And the writer, again, Paul, we even see that he has this, this battle with Peter. Do we know who Peter is? He's one of the, the 12 disciples of Jesus. Peter was just a simple fisherman. He was a simple man, but he walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He saw Jesus perform miracles. And we, all, we know that story even of in the New Testament when Peter's all frustrated. He's trying to cast his net out and to catch fish. And that's when Jesus comes up to him and says, cast on the other side. You can kind of sense Peter's frustration. Why do I want to do that? And eventually he listened to the Lord and did just that. And he couldn't even pull all the fish in. Again, he got to see Jesus. He got to observe Jesus and walk with him. But yet, even Peter had some struggles. In the, seventh, in the 11th verse of chapter 2, we observe that even Peter would act one way in front of the Jewish Christians and he would act a completely separate way to the Gentile Christians. And this was hypocritical. Paul, again, the author of Galatians, saw that and says, Peter, no, you cannot do that. That is not for you to do. You're, you're a hypocrite. You are doing these things. You're acting this way and you're trying to uh, have these, uh, these Gentiles act like Jews, but they're not Jews. Verse 14, but when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, I said to Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So Paul, again, was upset. He's, again, the Lord used Paul to write this letter to these churches to, to correct some actions that's going on within these churches. And... Uh, to, to steer them back to that wonderful truth of the gospel. So they're not perverting the gospel. What is that gospel? The gospel message is simple. It's Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel summed up. Why did Christ have to die? 
Why was a man by the name of Jesus, God Almighty, 100% God, 100% man, why did he have to die? He had to die for me. He had to die for you. He had to die for the sins of the whole world. Why did he have to do just that? Because there needs to be a penalty for sin. Just as if you commit a crime, the penalty for that is, is uh, dependent on how severe the crime is. It could be a year in jail. It could be five. It could be 50. Whatever it may be. It could be a fine. It could be that. Whatever it is. So there is always a penalty for wrongdoing. Well, our wrongdoing is sin, and we've inherited this, unfortunately. This isn't something you can put to the side and say, well, I'll tackle that at another time. No, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, the gospel is simple, that Jesus Christ gave himself to be your penalty. That judge is standing in front of that person that just committed such a horrible crime, and, and here's a picture of, of the judge's own son coming and saying, you know, what, judge, whatever crime or whatever punishment you're going to put on that individual for that crime, give it to me instead. You know, you're going to give that man five years in jail. I'll take that instead. You're going to give him 50 years in jail. I'll take that instead. Judge, punish me. Don't punish him. And you would say, that's absurd. Well, that's what Jesus did. That the gospel, again, Jesus Christ dying and was buried and was resurrected. He conquered death because he was a sinless, spotless, perfect lamb. That's why our sins could be covered by Jesus, because he did no wrong. He did no sin. And for any other gospel to come in that says that Jesus was a potential sinner, mark them, avoid them, don't listen to them, because Jesus never sinned. If he did, then our salvation is in vain. If you entertain the idea that Jesus was a sinner, that he had to repent from a particular sin, mark that, put that to the side and saying that is a false gospel. That's exactly what's going on with Galatians and that Paul says, no, that cannot creep into this church. And so church, when we look at the, this epistle, when we see and observe uh, the different reasons why this was written. It was written because of the hypocrisy that was going on. It was, go it was written because of the legalism they were trying to add to salvation. They were trying to add rules and regulations that were not necessary. But then ultimately it was a perversion of the gospel. And which brings us to that first question. Why should this epistle be studied in the 21st century? Why should we learn of what went on you know, back in the A.D. 50s, why is that relevant to today? Well, ultimately it's relevant because it's quite common in today's world, a perversion of the gospel. A lot of times there's, there's truth that's added to salvation and you must follow this in order to be genuinely saved. There are preachers and pastors and proselyters and evangelists and missionaries and religious leaders who have simply perverted the gospel to a point where it's no longer effective. Some claim that Jesus was merely a good person. Some are so bold to say that our Lord was a sinner and needed to ask for forgiveness. If our Lord, if he truly was sinful, how could, our, he, how could he be our sinless and spotless sacrifice? Church, we cannot allow for that type of false teaching to creep into our churches. We often hear the phrase, history repeats itself, well, in, today, in some of today's prominent churches, the Galatian movement has been repeated. That these false teachers have come in and crept in and, and uh, skirted their way around and started teaching things like, oh, well, there really isn't a place called hell. They've crept in and said, oh, well, Jesus, he was, he was a man and men were sinful beings and, and uh, that Jesus had to repent of his sin. There's movements creeping in. We're trying to steer us away from that gospel message, and we cannot allow that. That is one of the reasons why we must study this epistle, because this teaching can creep in, and if we're not careful, history will repeat itself with what happened in AD 40s and AD 50s when, when this epistle was written. It can and it will repeat itself. There is no amount of works that you can do that will ever be enough to earn the favor of God. Remember when we looked at that, those simple illustrations. Again, I'm a simple man, so I like pictures. And remember, I had that ladder over here of religion when we studied real Christianity. And then we had the cross of Christ on this side. And you could work and you could step and you can give and you can do all these things to try to earn God's favor. 
But it's just like the Galatians where they were adding to that, that gospel message and we cannot allow that to happen. And so that's why this epistle must be studied. We must get a grasp on this book to truly understand what freedom in Christ is all about. Freedom in Christ. So the theme of this entire book is relatively simple. Freedom in Christ. Oh, that means I'm free to do whatever I want. I'm free to sin. I'm free to go about with whatever, uh, whatever sin that I want to invest into. That's, that's what I can do, right? Well, it's not. 5 verse 1 says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit against to a yoke of slavery. So what this is saying, it's giving a picture here. Uh, Jesus is saying that there's freedom in me or there's slavery to sin. You can either choose to be free in Jesus Christ or you can be a slave to sin. What has Christ freed us from? He has set us free from the bondage of sin. All of us, we have a general idea of what freedom is, right? We think that we have a freedom that we could do whatever we want, and when we want, you know, we live in America, we live in a free nation. Well, in a sense, we can't just go about and do whatever we want, right? There is limitations on our freedom. We believe that freedom is hearing only what we want to hear. Or not allowing anyone to oppose anything on us. I'm a free individual. That's what I believe what freedom is, we say. We have this idea that... In freedom, there's no moral absolutes, that there's no moral restraints, that there's no kind of accountability, there's no responsibility, or that there's a freedom from being judged by the way that I'm living my life. And a lot of times, that's what we think freedom is. Well, if we take that definition of freedom and apply that to, to uh, the gospel message and to, and to salvation, it is deception. There is no freedom for the lost individual. There is no freedom for that lost soul that is bound and constrained to sin. If I had chains, we could chain one of our young teenagers up right now. They would love that, right? And they, they wouldn't be allowed to move anywhere. Chained them to this pulpit, maybe. And uh, they couldn't go anywhere. We could lock the key and keep them here all day. Wouldn't that be fun? Probably Aaron would really appreciate that with some of his kids, right? He's shaking his head. So... But we, we think that even if we're locked up and chained up, we think, oh, I can I'm have freedom to do whatever I want. But you're not. You're bound by this thing called sin. And with that bondage comes that old nature that you're restricted by that old nature. And they do not possess the new nature that we spoke of with our Real Christianity series. So again, why is this epistle... Uh, worthy to be studied so we can learn of the freedom we have in Christ. It was for freedom that Christ set us free, says Galatians 5 verse 1. Freedom. The lost soul does not have freedom from sin, does not have freedom from guilt, no freedom from fear, worry, anxiety. There is no freedom from judgment or freedom from eternal punishment. So that's why we look at this book, because we can see the gospel message evident here. We can see that we can be free from that old nature. We can be free from the bondage of slavery. We can be free to worship Jesus Christ, to love him, to have that freedom in Christ. Enter the book of Galatians. We now have been set free from the bondage of sin because of Christ and him alone. Nothing that we have done. Nothing that false teachers have said for us to do and then we follow through with them and now we have that freedom. No, we have freedom in Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor Jeremy, you've only gotten through, you haven't even, we haven't even turned the page yet. We've got five minutes left. I love Galatians. This series, <clears throat> right now I have about 18 messages planned, 15 to 18. And uh, if it takes, if it goes at this rate, we'll be here for at least three years. But um, looking, looking beyond, uh, 
you know, as we look at this study, we're going to take our time with Galatians. I, 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 if we rush it, you know, it will, we'll do it injustice and we'll miss something. And, and I don't want to miss anything with this passage. But quickly, I want to help you fill in the outline for Galatians because I really want to get into the very first verse and the first chapter next week. And so I want to lay this, this back, background for you and outline the whole book. So that way we have a general idea of where we're going in this study. So again, we answered those two very important questions. Why should we study this epistle? And why was this epistle written to begin with? Again, it was because of the false teachers, because of all the things that crept in. And so why should we study it now so we can stop that from happening with our body? So we can stop that kind of thinking with wherever we, we talk with people because... Uh, there's some prominent evangelists out there, some pastors, some teachers, and they say, well, what about this individual? Well, now, as a study in Galatians, you'll be able to answer those things and help defend the Bible stance on what the Bible says about the gospel. So again, that's why it's important for us to study this book today. So number one, the very first chapter, to get a whole general uh, synopsis of this chapter, is simply as you are born to be free. You're born to be free. That's what this, this uh, whole chapter speaks of. And one of the uh, things that uh, amazes me is how different the introduction is compared to all the other epistles. Paul here, he omits the customary greeting. It, it just goes out the window. And he, he begins by saying, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of God. Of Christ, I'm astonished that you're just you're going away. Galatians 1 verse 6. He omits that customary greeting. And then another th key point here is that Paul's message, I'm sorry, uh, there's no other gospel. No other gospel. Paul omits the customary greeting. And then another uh, key point in uh, this first chapter is that there is no other gospel. That nothing else can save you other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And then the third key point is the calling of God. That uh, he, he lays this foundation that God is the one who called me to, to present to you this wonderful message. So those are all different points that we'll be looking at in the, in the weeks to come. Second chapter, as we think of a key verse, Galatians 2, verse 14. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, this is Simon Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So the key points here in this passage is that uh, Paul's message in the first several verses, that his message is uh, authoritative and that it is accepted. And secondly, Paul, he has this battle with Peter. He corrects Peter, and we'll look at that, and it's an interesting story that transpires. And then we look at the explanation of what justification is, and uh, we'll see that. Uh, it's a whole message in and of itself. Third chapter. Again, this is just a quick outline, quick overview. I wasn't planning on, on taking a lot of time because we'll, we'll devote several messages throughout these uh, chapters. But I wanted to give you an overall bird's eye view of, of the whole book. So third chapter, the key verse is Galatians 3 verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Putting to rest the differences in the Jews and the Gentiles, and that all happens and 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 takes place there. That uh, they were struggling. That that there were works. That uh, here are some of the key points: works do not produce justification. Remember, justification. We'll look at that more in detail. But it's just as if I never saved. We could uh, say, but works do not produce justification. Second key point is the righteous must live by faith. And we'll have a whole message devoted just to that. And then chapter, chapter uh, 2, or chapter 3, verse 15 through 29, the promise is greater than the law. And really looking forward when we get into that uh, portion of Galatians. All right, chapter 4. There is freedom because of grace. Freedom because of grace. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. 
And if a son, then an heir through God. The key verse here of chapter 4. Some of the key points that we'll be looking at is Gentiles, they can be the children of God uh, through adoption. Gentiles, the, the salvation has been offered to them. It didn't just stay with just the Jews. Salvation is offered to all. And also that slavery under the law and this battle between slavery and freedom under grace. In chapter 4. Chapter 5, we already looked at this particular verse. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. That we do have this freedom in Christ. That we have this freedom to walk with Christ. And then we have freedom to walk in the Spirit. And then the close of this particular epistle comes with a sense of unity. That there's this freedom to be unified in Christ. And that Paul ends on, on a positive note here. After he spent the first five chapters really hammering at home of the gospel of Christ. And here he's saying, in this freedom, now that you know uh, of the gospel of Christ and the truth behind it, that there, is, there should be this sense of unity among the churches. That these four churches that I'm writing to, there needs to be unity here. And that you can have this unity in Christ and one way to do that is to bear one another's burdens. That's a way that unification can be achieved. To help one another. Not just when someone stumbles and falls in sin. and Not just kick them down the road and ah, you'll be fine. That's not what Christ wants us to do. So we can see throughout this epistle that, that the close of it. To bear one another's burdens. And then we can have success through the cross. We can have success through the cross. The world's definition of success is to, uh, to uh, have more wealth at the end of the year than you had at the beginning. Well, that's, that's not Christianity success. That's not having success in Christ. And we'll see in the last chapter what it truly means to have success. And it's just simply to be obedient. To be humble and to be obedient. If you're that in your Christian life, you are a successful individual and we'll have a whole message devoted to that but Galatians again it's like Christmas I couldn't wait to introduce this series to you and we'll be spending the next couple weeks uh, going through chapter one and we'll take just a short break for Easter and not sure yet though because there are some passages that really revolve around so we might even be in Galatians uh, during Easter and uh, because the resurrection is found all throughout the book of Galatians, because again, that's part of the gospel. So again, I hope that you're looking forward to it as much as I am, and, uh, but really wanted to lay just a brief synopsis of the whole book and give a, a, a foundation of why this epistle was written and why is it relevant for us to study today. Let's close in a word of prayer, and then we will be dismissed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy and for your love. And you have given us so much. Father, I pray that you would just be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Do we have a closing song? I didn't talk to you at all, but praise team. Is the praise team all still here? Can we close with um, I Will Rise? Can we, can we do that as I'm throwing you guys under the bus? But uh, I love that song. Um, I think that's the name of it, right? The last song that you guys sang. All right, I wanted to make sure. But uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. God bless you all, and we'll see you all next week. And we're going to close uh, by singing this song. Let's all stand as we close and we sing.
I pray, Lord, that you'll just go before our church, dismiss us with your blessings. God, we thank you and praise you for the victory that we have in you and the freedom we have in Jesus. Bless this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, if you would like to help out with the Sportsman Bank, we're just going to have a brief uh, meeting up here. I uh, just want to go over just a couple of things. And if you're interested at all in helping out, whether it's serving, setting up, decorating, whatnot, want to just get a general idea of, of who would like to be involved in that. We're really looking forward to, to putting this on for our community, inviting all kinds of people to come. So if you'd like to help, please come up. And we're just going to have a brief couple-minute meeting up here. If not, God bless you all. Thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll see you all next week. God bless.